Welcome to the Steady On Podcast, where God's hard truth meets your hard story. I don't need to tell you that life gets hard. Life gets hard, really hard. But God's faithfulness is still active and alive in our hard. And these episodes are dedicated to remembering and claiming the promises of a faithful God. I'm your host, Angie Bauman. I'm a pastor and Bible teacher, founder of Steady On Ministries, and creator of the Step-by-Step Bible Study Method. But more than that, I'm a trauma and abuse survivor who carried a heavy weight of shame and worthlessness for many years, and I still struggle, but I live in much more freedom now because I know God through His Word and speak truth to the lies of the enemy with His Word. And that's what we do here. On Mondays, we take it in by studying the promises of God, And on Wednesdays, we live it out with teaching and testimony on the promises of God. So thank you for tuning in, my friend. You are the reason for this show, and I'm so very, very glad you are here. Let's get started. Hey there, and welcome. Today, we're going to be visiting with sportscaster, speaker, author, and founder of the I'm Changing the Narrative movement, Rachel Barbeau. Rachel is a powerhouse, and it's easy to see why she's in such demand at colleges and organizations around the nation to help individuals realize their deep potential. Rachel has overcome her own challenges, including an eight-year-long addiction to hard drugs and thoughts of suicide. She sat down to talk to me about her passion for sharing her struggles to help others open up about their own battles with mental health. She is passionate about reminding her readers and listeners that our identity is not in what we do, but in who we serve. Our verse this week comes from the book of Judges. It's this little, not so little statement the angel of the Lord makes to Gideon as Gideon is being called to save Israel from oppression. The ICB says it this way, you have the strength to save the people of Israel. Rachel believes she has the strength to save people. She's been in the fire, she says. And now that she's out, she wants to bring buckets of water to help the people still in there. I love that illustration because it's pick upable. Sometimes we get paralyzed because we think we have to save everyone or put out the whole fire to make a difference, when in reality, we only need to fill up the bucket we can carry and pour it out on the one closest to us. I think you'll hear that encouragement in Rachel's story today. Let's listen in. Rachel, welcome. So glad you are here to talk with us today. Help us to get to know you just a little bit, if you will. Tell us a bit about your background and the hashtag I'm changing the narrative. Yes, thank you for having me so much. So excited. Um, I'm Changing the Narrative was born out of a problem. Mm -hmm. And I think there are amazing things in everybody who's listening to this podcast. There are amazing things that can be born from your pain for a problem. I also think that you have a heavenly job title. Um, I haven't talked about this in some time, but your question made me think about it. You know, we on this earth go by banker, you know, we go by podcaster, we go by those things. Um, You know, in heaven, I think they are broader, deeper titles. They might be encourager. Mm. They might be connector. Um, You know, people call me a speaker. It's funny. I'm like, you know, they call me a motivational speaker and I love it. Don't get me wrong, but there's so much more that I do. I feel like I'm a teacher. I feel like I am a professional encourager. You know, I feel like I'm a connector. But yeah, seven years ago, I saw a problem with college athletics. It happened to start in college athletics. Um, And that summer for college football fans, it was a very dark summer. There was domestic violence, sexual violence, guys getting in trouble, coaches getting in trouble. And I was the first female host on Sirius XM on their collegiate channels. And I would have to back up from the camp or from the microphone during breaks and cry. I'm like, Mm -hmm. what is going on here? What is happening to the sport that I've given my life to covering? And, um, and so I was just audacious enough to believe that I could do something about it. I believe God made me a do something girl. And so I created this very simple curriculum that was, who are you away from the field? What makes your heart beat faster? And then my own experience with domestic violence and teaching others how to never let that happen in their, in their midst. And what was born from a yes, Mm. that's really powerful. Just simply saying, yes, God, I'll go. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do it. I'm terrified. I'm unqualified. I'm all of these things, but I will go. Um, turned into something beyond my ever loving imagination. And doesn't he just love to do that, right? Like, yes. he loves that. so now here we are uh, in summation. I feel like a lawyer in summation. Um, now here we are seven years later and something that I thought I would just do and be a sports and, you know, just give these talks on the side and be a sportscaster for, you know, until I retired 
I retired in 2019 from sports casting, the thing that I had identified with for 17 years. And uh, now we've worked with over 60 colleges, many mm -hmm. of them multiple times on a yearly basis. We've hosted five national mental health collegiate football games. I've worked with the Big Ten, the Big 12, the Northern Sun, U.S. Customs and Border Patrol, law enforcement in multiple states, prison ministry, halfway houses, churches, K through five high schools. And now I also train other speakers um, to go out and tell their story based on the principles of I'm changing the narrative. And I wrote a book. So mm. it's, <laughs> and it all started from a yes. I it know. I love, I love this so much. We are a sports family. Okay. Um, my husband is an administrator at Southern Illinois University or yeah. D one school, and he's over the athletics program. And we have dear, dear friends who are, um, you know, their life is college sports. My son is the manager for the Saluki basketball team here. And so college sports is a big part of our lives. And, um, and so I feel like I am in a different way connected because I'm, 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 I'm a, I'm a mother of these Boy, you know, I'm at the age now yeah. where these boys that are playing sports, I could be their mother, yes. I guess. Right. And so, and I watch Rachel, this will make me emotional. I watch what they're carrying what they're trying to put out uh, being, I think people do not understand sometimes how vulnerable it is to give your all on a playing field, right. What, or, or a court or something like that. Um, and these boys and the women too, I, I'm, I'm the women too. I'm not as connected with the women's sports here, but um, these boys are under a lot of pressure as student athletes. And so I guess I just say that to just make that connection and, and be like, I think this is something that is a incredibly important to talk about. And so I just want to have a follow-up question here. What is the narrative that you are called to change? You think what's, what's the, what's the narrative that you want to like, sort of uh, throw a stick in that spinning wheel, if you will, and say, uh-uh, let's not do it this way. So can I blow your mind? About yes. Connection? I just love when God does this. SIU Salukis. Go dogs were one of the first schools that I visited. <sighs> I have been to the Salukis. You can ask your husband, um, ask your son. I've been there four times in seven years. I did not know this. Yes. Nick Hill is a friend of mine. It we started love with, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> it started with the football program. And then I visited with the Queens and, uh, and then they said, oh my gosh, like we need, I was just there two, maybe two, three years ago. And then they said, we need you for all the athletes. And so, yeah, so please go back and tell anybody and everybody um, I said, hello there. That is um, craziness. Yes. I'm so glad we yes. made that connection. I don't, know. don't ever come to Carbondale again without letting me know, I, Rachel. I will, <laughs> I will let you know, but yeah, the, the, the narrative I, I'm, I'm hoping to change is it's multifaceted. One is that, um, you were your identity. That's mm -hmm. the big one that started in, in athletics. But I think now, since my movement has spread out to professionals, it's you are more than a cop. You are more than a border patrol agent. You're more than an athlete. And honey, if you believe you were only born to play sports and that's your worth, mm -hmm. what a shame that is, right? The other narrative is, is that is, um, that you were born for anything less than purpose and legacy. You were born to create legacy. You were born to change your life and the lives of many other people. And while you may not win a Nobel prize, you may raise a child that you, and you break generational curses that have been passed down through your family and it stops with you. That's the way you may create legacy. I don't know what your grand purpose is. You may start a movement. It may be for profit. It may be nonprofit. It may be a hobby. You may, I was use this example. You may be somebody who's great at photography, but that ends up going to the, the, uh, the shelters, the DV shelters and takes pictures of mothers and children who are coming out and gets them glammed up and gets pictures to make them feel normal and beautiful. I don't know what your thing is, but I think that the world is trying to program a narrative into us and it will, and it has through social media and social norms and societal norms and all of those things. And if we are not very careful um, and very intentional, we fall prey to that. And I think that's why we are seeing um, so much the scourge of, of, of suicide, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of mental health issues, 
because we are we are constantly being flooded. And my book and my movement is all about fighting back and being relentless and seeking, spreading and noticing joy. Yeah, I love that. I think that's one of the reasons sometimes that injuries for the athletes are so emotionally devastating yeah. too, because it, it sidelines them in a way. And they ask these really hard questions. Who am I now? If I yeah. can't perform this way, who am I now? So I want to talk about your story too. Tell us how uh, trauma and, um, and a season of darkness really affected your life and shaped your mission. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, bless my own heart. You know, but <laughs> I was telling somebody we earlier, write what we need to read. Do we not? Right? <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I was telling somebody earlier today, I said, man, uh, I've been through enough in my life um, that, you know, if I went and lived on a, you know, lone mountain, you know, in a cave with a pet goat, you know, nobody would blame me. I mean, I've just, I've been through a lot in my life. I've been through yeah. addiction. I've battled addiction and come out the other side. I've been through abuse. Um, I've lost both my parents. I've lost everything and crawled back. Mm -hmm. And um, and and I'm still here and I still have joy. And I, I really feel like at the end of the day, um, you know, there's really two choices and it's, you know, it's bitter or better. And there have been times in my life where I have been bitter and seasons where I've been bitter. I mean, there were times after losing my mother to, to breast cancer when I saw somebody else's mom, you know, beat cancer, or have a good report, I was mad. I would cry. I would, you know, say, why did, why did they get, you know, why did they beat it? My mommy didn't get to beat it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I really had to uh, let God deal with me. Uh, I had to do a lot of work. I think, and maybe in some, you know, faith spaces, this is controversial, but I think, you know, therapy and Jesus you know, for some people, they need medication and Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think, you know, God put amazing, amazing professionals on this planet to be able to do their jobs well and help people. And that is their right. They're heavenly. That's part mm -hmm. of their heavenly calling. And so, so yeah, so I've been through it. And I think that's what makes the book. I mean, obviously, I'm partial because I wrote it. But I think that's what makes the book and the movement um, really poignant. And people have told me is that you are not telling somebody else's story. I mean, there are historical stories in there and whatnot, but in general, when I go speak, I am telling my own stories and I'm saying, I have been in the pit. I have learned, I, I've been on the mountaintop and I've been face down in the mud. And let me tell you something, I learned way more about myself when I was face down in the mud than I ever did on the mountaintop. Yeah. Hey friend, I'm jumping in right here to let you know that for months now I have been sitting at my desk thinking about you and praying for you as I felt God guiding me to create a new space for women who want to make studying the Bible a priority in their lives. And just a few months from now, Study On University will be born. Study On University is going to be anchored with the step-by-step -step Bible study method, and it'll be a place for women to study and gain confidence and participate in community and receive teaching and build spiritual friendships. And I would love for you to be a part of the beta group that will help me test all aspects of this project before Study On University launches in January 2024. Beta team members are going to receive discount rates participation in crucial decision making, the opportunity to earn affiliate funds, and a signed copy of my new study, Love Never Fails. It's going to be the first thing we use inside Steady On University. You can learn more about the Steady On University beta team by clicking the link in the show notes. I so hope that you will consider joining me for this adventure. And I will tell you the beta team is going to be limited to 25 people. So jump on board sooner rather than later. Thank you so much for listening. And now, back to the show. Yeah. Would you say there was a face down in the mud moment that helped you really draw a line in the sand? No more. I need to make a change. How, how did that realization come around? Cause I think I've read that you really can identify with these athletes and that a lot of your identity was wrapped up in your career and in your profession. Yeah. Right. So I know, you know, their heart, I think around some of those issues that they're dealing with, what was that like for you or what happened that you were like, something has to change. You know, it's interesting you say that because here I was, I was traveling and speaking and telling them you're more than an athlete. And then when I got ready to retire myself to go full time and I'm changing the narrative, I was like, wait a minute, but you know, who am I now? Right. Yeah. yeah. I was like, yeah, yeah. Who am I now? And I had a friend who was so good to me. She, her name's Gina. She works at the NCAA now. And she said, Rachel, you're more than a sportscaster. And I was like, oh my gosh, like this message I've been telling everybody else, I have to receive myself. And so uh, there was that and and also a trigger warning. I, I had what I call a dark night of the soul. 
uh, where I had suicidal ideations and was very, very close to taking my own life. And, um, and, and, and what the devil meant to kill me, Hmm. uh, he actually had no idea that he gave me the blueprint to be able to save millions of lives. And so what I say in the book and what I say in real life is that I came out of the fire and I survived it. And so now I'm going to go back over and over and over again with buckets of water for people that are still in the burning building. And I'm going to tell them, you know, uh, I'm going to tell them who's the author of, of these, these thoughts in your head. I'm going to tell them you're not defective. You're not broken. You're not weak. I'm going to give them battle plans like I regularly do. And, you know, I, I'm going to talk about this because when we talk about it, we normalize it. Yes. I was visiting with a friend of mine, his name's Eric, and he has an amazing movement called Same Here Global. And, you know, he was talking about this stat, this one in five stat, you know, and I think it's one of the studies that came out and past couple of years. And he said, you know, really that's a polarizing stat because it's like, oh, one of these five, right. is going to have issues. Truth be told, if we all, if we all want to take off the mask, not your COVID mask, the mask you wear for the world, I'll bet it's five out of five have gone through either anxiety or depression or God forbid a dart of the soul or suicidal ideations and never told anybody or are struggling in some way. Right. And if you haven't, I tell people this all the time, if you haven't, you know, just like hurt people, hurt people, healed people, heal people, help Amen. somebody, show them the way, walk with them to therapy, help make the appointment with them, you know, call. We have this kind of thing we've been teaching and I'm changing the narrative the last, I'd say couple of months. And it's really, if we're depending on people to reach out for help when they're struggling, I think we're going to continue to see what we're seeing, which is a scourge in this plague. What we're now asking people to do, and it's the very essence of being a joy starter, which is in the book, is we're asking people to go reach in for people because mm. having been depressed myself and battled anxiety, I know it was like emotional quicksand. And to ask me to reach out at that time, I felt ashamed. And um, I am so grateful for people that said, I got you. I will not let you drown. I will not let you fail. Mm -hmm. I will not let you not eat or be alone. I'm, I've, I've got you. And so if we can raise up an army of people that are, um, as Andy Andrews says, noticers as you know, as what I like to call, I call it in my world, a joy starter, which is somebody who is saying, I'm not going to take no for an answer. No, I'm going to help you come unpack your apartment. I'm going to bring that pizza. No, I, I know you're not okay. I love you. I love you enough to stand in the gap for you. Yes, I love that. And I want to talk to you about the difference between isolation and solitude, because you were just talking about the author. I'm going to tell you who the author is of those thoughts in your head, right? And I think one of the enemies that one in five that you're just saying, I think one of the enemy's greatest tactics is to somehow convince us that we're alone in our whatever, what, you know, you're, you're the only one that thinks this, you're the only one that feels this, you're the only yeah. one that's ever been here. Right. Um, and I think that's isolation, but I'd like to hear your take on the difference between isolation and solitude. Don't even put words in your mouth. You can, however it is, but, but also I know that you believe solitude can lead to great joy. So will you just teach us your feelings and thoughts around that yeah. for a moment? Yeah. Yeah, it's great because I get to teach people all over the world about the joy of loving yourself and spending time by yourself. Mm. I've taken solo vacations and they are the bomb.com. I mean, they are amazing. And then I'll have a mother or father say to me, well, I can't get away for that long. Well, you know what? Book a, book a night at a hotel, save some points, book a night at a hotel, pack your bag with your favorite books, mm -hmm. you know, bring your candles bring, you know, something to wash out the tub so you can take a soak, you know, watch your favorite movie, do snow angels on the bed, you know, and let that be your one night away if, if that's all you can do. Or just uh, my favorite days are to take a day and just amble and ramble and have nowhere to go, you know, and just, just piddle. We, we call it piddling in the South and talk to people and meet people or you know, those types of things. And so I really enjoy spending time by myself. And the reason why I enjoy spending time by myself so much now is that I love myself. I laugh at myself. I talk to myself. I love myself enough to know that I've got a long way to go because we're all a work under construction and that God has some healing still to do in me. And that, and so, you know, I know my love myself enough to know that therapy helps with that. And Jesus helps with that and quiet time and Bible and all of those things. Um, but yeah, solitude is a beautiful thing. And when you unlock this um, idea of liking to be with you, you know, I teach people this all the time, like half of us are going out in the entire world and we're begging people to love us and affirm us. And we don't even love ourselves. Right. 
And no one is ever going to fill that cup. Mm -hmm. God intended you. He made you a miracle. He intended you to love yourself. That's not unhealthy. You know, I was sharing with somebody today too, that, you know, I just recently made a post on Twitter and I asked people to talk about what they were proud of themselves for. And you could sense the hesitancy. And it's like, gosh, what are we doing here? Like you should, my mom, my late mother used to say, you know, if you don't toot your own horn, nobody else will. Now I'm not saying go around and toot, toot, toot all day. But you should be proud of yourself. You should love yourself. Now, when that solitude, that blessed solitude turns over into isolation, where you start to hear negative voices or a voice, one singular voice for me, and those things are nasty and negative, that's when you have to, have to, I'm begging you to reach out for community and, you know, and say to somebody around you, hey, it's a simple text. Remind me who I am. There's, you know, I'm so grateful to have people in my life that I could send A one sentence text to them that says, remind me who I am. And I would get, you know, lots of texts back. Um, And whether that's one person or what, but I would get uh, affirmations back. Mm -hmm. And and I want to teach people that um, you need to reach out and, and let your community love you when you're feeling isolation. I appreciate those words so much. In just the last couple of years, the Lord has really grown me in that area because I have always thought that somehow it was stronger to suffer in silence, if you will, Mm -hmm. you know, and to suffer alone, I'll just fix this myself. I'll deal with this myself or whatever. And in the last couple of years, he has just really encouraged me to like admit a need, admit a struggle, reach out to some people who are close to me and say, this day's hard for whatever reason, you know, I don't even have to explain it. Just like, I just feel like I could use some support today and people will People who love you will remind you that yeah. you are a, a a wonderful thing that takes up space on the planet, right? Yeah. I mean, like, you know, yeah. and sometimes you just need a kind word. And one of the things that I feel like radiates from you, Rachel, is just this ability to have grace for yourself. I don't know if you feel like that describes you accurately or not, but I see that and sense it as you're talking. And I think that's a learned something. Like I, I'm learning that where I am right now. Um, and I, I want to learn that better because I feel like I'm the hardest on myself and I have a hard time offering grace to myself, especially when I feel like you should have, what's all the shoulds, right? You should have done this faster. You should have done this better. You should have done this, whatever. And I'm just, I wonder, do you feel like you're someone who offers grace to yourself? I see that in you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I do. I, um, you know, I, I, Look, we, we say in my movement, you're a king, a queen, a royal under construction. Mm. And so what does that mean? That means that um, it means there's no grass growing up underneath my feet. It means I'm seeking, I'm growing, I'm learning, I'm failing, and I'm saying I'm sorry. When I say um, in our movement, when I say be a king, be a queen, be royal, a king or a queen or royal is not perfect. There is no one perfect except the one who hung on the cross, right? And 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 God, the father and the, the Trinity, right? There's nobody perfect but that. What it means is, when you're a king, a queen, a royal, and I use that last term to be inclusive, what I mean by that is I mean, you're somebody who knows better, so you do better. It means when you mess up, you screw up, you say you're sorry. It means you clear any grudges. It means at the end of the day, you take a look in the mirror deeper than your face or your nose hairs, or your eyebrows or any of those things. And you say, am I proud of me today? All the decisions that I made today, did I get up early? Did I get enough sleep? Did I fuel my body properly? Did I keep my word? Did I give max effort and practice or at that meeting? Or do, what did I do? And, and if you need to fix it, you fix it. And, you know, the thing that we lie to ourselves and we tell ourselves is we have time. I have time to do that. Time to truly in the book, I talk about it. We're all just walking each other home. I could have 50 more years on this planet. I could have one more day on this planet. I could I could pass away, you know, after this interview, we don't, we don't know. And so when uh, that grace, I think comes from teaching this all over the the world and then also having that same grace for myself. And I, I tell people this all the time, when I go into these talks and do interviews and write books like this, I can't, I can't go into a talk and have beef with somebody. So if my husband and I are fighting and we fight like any other married couple does, or if something's going on before I go speak or do anything to talk about this movement, I'm like, babe, I love you. Or I'm sorry. Or let me slide a note, you know, because how can I go teach from a place that I'm not 
espousing. I'm not doing what I'm teaching you. And to me, that would be hypocritical. And that's the fastest way for the enemy to get a foothold. And that's the fastest way to make God sad. And I don't want to make God sad. And, you know, at the end of the day, I heard somebody say, I heard, I heard it a long time ago, but I heard it the other day too. Our goal should to be, should be to be a Bible with skin on it. Mm-hmm. And will we ever get there? No, we will not. But that's my goal every day. And every morning it's a new and there's joy comes in the morning and there's forgiveness. And so how can I not give that same forgiveness to somebody else? Yeah, Especially I love myself. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes. I, I hope that if you're listening to that, I hope you're really listening to her say that because I do feel like that's another way that the enemy just gets in there with the temptation to believe his lies is that somehow we're immune or we have an asterisk by our name when it comes to the grace that is so abundantly offered. Um, yeah. I and that's, that's where so shame grows. So, you know, oh, it's absolutely. Just, it's, yeah. it, I heard Nona Jones. I think she's an author. She came to my church. She said, shame is like mold. Mm-hmm. It grows in dark, damp places. Yeah. And the one that my mom taught me a lot of things. One of the things she taught me was um, to chase God with a fervor that, that scares hell. And so when she screwed up, instead of hiding from God, she would just chase the hem of his garment, like the woman in the Bible with the issue of blood. And so for me, having gone through all the things I've gone through, you know, the devil is trying to keep me in in shame. And, and, and I, I, especially being somebody who survived addiction, I, and God saving me from that after an eight year addiction to hard drugs, I just, I refuse to let shame multiply in, in the dark. And if it's drugs or money or sex or porn or gambling or food or whatever it is, addiction and the shame of addiction will suck the life out of you. If you can find a trusted person, uh, a friend, a family member, somebody at your church and just say, hey, look, I'm struggling. Chances are you're going to find somebody around you that says me too, or I can help you get the resources you need. Right. And it's just <laughs> the feeling is completely yeah. different when you finally share that with somebody and get it out of the dark. Yeah. And if yeah. you share it with someone and their response is not helpful, that doesn't mean sharing it was wrong. Keep yes. sharing it. Find the person that can help you. I just want to go like on record and say yes. that sometimes, yes. Yes. sometimes we get really brave and we take a risk and yes. that person can't hold it well, but that doesn't so mean no one can't hold it well. And so we have to keep we have to keep being brave until we can find the person who will link their arm with us and and help us point us in the right direction or some help us move forward. You make such a great point because it's like I, I liken it to sticking your head out of the turtle shell. And yes. somebody sticks their head out of the turtle shell and they ask for help. And the person that they ask for help is either not in a place where they can give help or hold space, or maybe something's going on in their life, or yeah. they're not emotionally ready for that yeah. or healed enough. And so oftentimes you go put your head back in the turtle shell and you never ask for help again. And you've got to be relentless in the pursuit of of what sets your soul on fire, of healing, of joy. We are living in a day and time where we cannot willy nilly anything in this world Mm -hmm. anymore, especially this precious life that we have been given. You need to run after it and go after it with everything you got. Yeah. And if that first person, like you said, was not emotionally prepared or in a place where they could handle that. And the other thing I think is a great setup for that is, hey, um, you know, if I was saying to you, hey, Angie, you know, I am, I'm just really struggling with something right now. And um, uh, do you happen to have some time to talk later? You know, that is a great way to set some boundaries. And I've been coached somebody on the other side who never got that kind of prompt. And the person from work would call and say, I only need 10 minutes. And two hours later, she was stuck on the phone. And so what I taught her to say is, Hey, I would love to do that, but right now I'm not in a in mm-hmm. a an emotional space where I can provide that, you know, hand holding or the ears this yeah. time. But here's some other resources or here's some things I suggest. So I think having those prompts of saying, Are you ready? or could I talk to you might also help you find mm-hmm. the appropriate person to be able to share that with. Yeah, I love that tip too, just because I just hate to say, just tell someone and then that person gets shut down. It's almost, it's worse than if you right. hadn't, because like I took the, you know, so I, I appreciate that so much to be able to, to help someone move forward, to be able to get the help that they need. So yeah, that's good. Hey, as we wrap up, this has been so fantastic. And I just wonder 
what's just bringing you joy? You you write about joy, and I just what what's bringing you joy? I'm sure like you're launching this book, and you're probably tired of all the interviews and all no. of those things. Oh, <laughs> you can say you are. It's okay. I'm it's not. a lot. Okay, well, it's no, a I'm, lot. Yeah. really, yeah. yeah. So what? I mean, where where's the joy right now in your life? Yeah. So um, it's it's in a lot of different places, but I will say it's uh, perspective is everything. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I saw something the other day that said no is just like the first couple of letters of not right now. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. But um, perspective is is so huge to me. So I can get overwhelmed with all the things that have to happen to launch a book that I'm bringing on myself. Like I yeah. can just really nilly the launch, but I'm going full board, you know, goal set, goal setting, want to get this as many hands as possible, do all the things. And so I could get, uh, I could get overwhelmed with it, but perspective tells me I prayed for this book. Perspective mm. tells me that as creative as I want to get, I can get with this launch and that I am. I've got a, a friend who's an international musician named Laura Reed, who's doing an anthem for the song, like, an I mean, for the book. And uh, I've got another friend who's in the book, whose tea company is making a tea and renaming it Joy Starters. Like, oh. just amazing. So there's been a lot of joy in just digging in and knowing that this book is going to get in the hands of so many people that I know need it. Yeah. But just today, very quickly, I yeah. just came back from the grocery store and I came down the aisle and there was a veteran there and I'm a military brat. My husband's military, retired military. And, and he was asking the guy that was stocking the shelves at Winn-Dixie, Hey, can you read the sugar content on this for me? And um, and they were different backgrounds and different ages. And the guy was trying to read it and he was kind of, you know, and I was standing there and I said, uh, I said, can I help, you know? And then he said, yo, thank you so much. He said, I don't have my glasses. I can't really read. So I started to tell him the sugar content. And I said, sir, I said, the sugar content's really high. And I said, you know, it's not going to be very said, but I need the electrolytes. So I was able to stand there and go through the drinks with him mm-hmm. and find a good option for him with his medical condition and then just help him. And then the little guy stocking was just standing there. We all just kind of smiled at each other and we left. And I saw the the veteran again before I left. And I and he said, you know, God bless you. And I said, God bless you. I hope you have the greatest day. And to me, that's what I want to teach people. That is where the true like joy is of life. Like that, that little interaction day and being able to help that man make a healthier decision and seeing us all come together in that aisle of that grocery store was better than getting a $10,000 check today to me. And I want to teach you how to feel that way and notice those things. And it's out there. It's all around and it's just waiting to be noticed. Yeah. Notice those things. I love that story so much. I could feel the tears stinging my <laughs> because I think sometimes we just don't lift our head from our own stuff to notice what's going on around us. And just those interactions can be such a they're divine appointments. I think the Lord wants us to feel the joy of serving and being served. And yeah. And I think we just hold our hands to those so often. I don't have time for that, you know, and, um, and yes, we, we do, we can make time for that. Rachel, thank you so much for (laughs) just your uh, willingness to share pieces of your hard story, but the way that God is, has been and is faithful in them. And that joy is something that you're just, you know, reaching for and receiving and offering to others. It's just, it's just beautiful. Rachel can be found at rachelbarbo.com. Her book is Relentless Joy, Finding Freedom, Passion, and Happiness, Even When You Have to Fight for It. And I will link that and other places that she can be found and followed. We have a club called the Joy Starters Club. And it's where we um, actually have a journal here. You get like weekly affirmations to, sent straight to your phone. Then we send out a physical journal, not in a digital world, a physical journal where we write down our joys. We write mm-hmm. down about the veteran today at Winn-Dixie and the, and the stock boy. Because if we're not careful, mm-hmm. when we pass away, we're going to give our, our family a phone. And I don't want to give my family a phone. I remember being at my grandmother's and going through pictures and printing, you know, and those things. And I want my family to go through my journals and say, wow, this happened and that happened. She loved this. And so, yeah, that's, um, it's on the website. You can check it out. It's a cost of a cup of coffee a month, but it's a group of people. We do a, uh, a once a month live, um, and you get the journal and you get the affirmations and yeah. So that's wonderful. And there's some, there's something so powerful about writing things down for sure. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. It just gets in your head and in your heart in a different way. So I love that. Hey, all the best with this (laughs) launch and with the changing the narrative group and all just everything. Yeah. Just all the best with that. And for real, don't come to Carbondale again without letting me know. (laughs) When I, now when I come back to speak, you have to be my special guest and come hear me speak. I would be honored. Yes, absolutely. So thank you so much for being here with us and friend, thank you for listening until next time. Peace. Thank you, Rachel, for sharing your story with us today. And thank you for caring about this community and our college athletes. I know you've made a difference in their stories the way you've made a difference in ours. And go dogs. Our verse again this week is Judges 614 in the NIRV. It says, the Lord turned to Gideon. He said to him, you are strong. Go and save Israel from the power of Midian. I am sending you. And if you haven't yet, I encourage you to listen to Monday's Take It In episode where I focus on the word strong. Also, if you're interested in learning more about the beta group for Steady On University I mentioned in the mid-roll, please click the link in the show notes and take a minute to read more or email me at steadyonpodcast at gmail.com. I'd love to have your help on this project. Next week, our Take It In verse will be Lamentations 326, which reminds us it is good to wait quietly for deliverance from the Lord. And my guest will be Lori Pollock Short, who will join us to talk about what to do when we doubt God's timing and are itching to make something happen in our own strength. Yikes, right? If you haven't yet, I'd be so grateful if you would subscribe or follow the podcast on whatever directory you're using to listen. It only takes a second. It helps the show a great deal, and it guarantees you'll see new episodes as soon as they drop. Thank you so much for listening. I pray wherever your day takes you, you are walking in the confident knowledge that you are a beloved, cherished, child of God. Peace.